Okay, thanks for, for being here. So I'm Sean Trott, I'm from UC San Diego, and I'm gonna be presenting on work uh, I did recently on whether pressure against homophones or ambiguity can explain phonological neighborhoods. Uh, and this wor is work I did with Ben Bergen, also at uh, UCSD. So in research on language evolution, we're typically interested in uh, exploring why languages look the way they do. And so usually the approach here is to identify different kinds of selection pressures that are assumed to operate over real human languages in some way, and that result in either a positive selection pressure for, or again, some kind of property of human languages. So one of the properties that people identified is that real lexica are clumpy. And what I mean by this is that they have large phonological neighborhoods. Um, and so if we take a word like dog, the set of neighbors of a word like dog are those that differ in exactly one phoneme, like dot or log. So you can just make a single edit to dog and you'll turn it into either dot or log. Dot would be turned into pot with a single edit, which could be turned into cot with a single edit, which of course is also um, a neighbor of dot. And so it turns out that human lexica in general are very dense in the neighborhoods that they have. And so one question is why? So one explanation is just the existence of phonotactics. So phonotactics are basically rules uh, that real languages have about which sounds can occur in which sequence. And so phonotactics themselves are just gonna constrain the space of possible word forms that you could have. Rather than just putting any old sounds next to each other, any given language will have sort of a, a subset of the possible set of sounds that you could put in sequence with each other, which will just result in some amount of clumpiness. Uh, yet recent research in 2017 showed that even if you simulate basically languages or lexica that look like real lexica according to their phonotactics, those phonotactics are actually insufficient to account for the density that we observe in real languages. So that suggests that phonotactics can't really tell the whole story here. There has to be some other thing we need to posit for an explanation. So a natural suggestion then is, you know, compared to this baseline, we observe more of these neighborhoods in real lexica. That suggests that maybe they're selected for in some way. There's a positive selection pressure. And so as in typical in research on language evolution, if there's evidence sort of at a large scale for a positive selection pressure, you look for a psychological evidence or psycholinguistic evidence to see whether that is consistent, you know, with things that why neighborhoods would be selected for in the first place. And indeed, there's evidence that dense neighborhoods facilitate word form learning as well as word form production. And so you can see why um, there would be a potential selection pressure in favor of dense neighborhoods because it seems to benefit these aspects of learning and production. Um, but what we're interested in exploring is whether this clumpiness that we've observed could also be a byproduct of some other selection pressure that we haven't really accounted for in the baseline models that have been built previously. Um, and in fact, in biology, there's a lot of uh, beneficial traits that we observe in different organisms that actually emerge if you look at the historical evolutionary process as a byproduct of other kinds of selection pressures. And so here, one of the sort of analogies is I want to draw is maybe uh, it's possible that these dense neighborhoods don't emerge directly because of a positive selection pressure, but they emerge as a byproduct of some selection pressure against something else that we might already think exist in real languages. Um, and so related work has looked at whether real lexica select against um, the oversaturation of particular word forms with too many meanings. So in other words, a pressure against ambiguity in some way. Um, and so actually recent work uh, using very similar approaches to the work I just described, where we simulate uh, baseline lexica using the phonotactics of a real lexicon, it turns out that those baseline lexica end up having uh, many more homophones uh, than uh, real lexica. So real lexica, in other words, have fewer homophones um, than their phonotactics would predict. And in particular, um, where we find the difference is actually uh, in the upper bound of how many homophones get assigned. So it's not necessarily that there's more or less words with at least one homophone or, or multiple meanings. It's that word forms have a lower um, sort of tolerance for how many meanings you could assign. So these baselines end up having 40, 50 meanings assigned to them, whereas in many real languages, they have many fewer uh, meanings assigned to even the most homophonous word forms. So this suggests maybe there is a selection pressure against oversaturation to some degree. Um, and instead, maybe instead of putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, maybe you redistribute them more um, sort of uniformly or, or slightly less concentratedly across phonotactic space. And so the question is whether this would create larger neighborhoods in its stead, um, just as a byproduct of this process. So the question is whether smoothing can create clumpiness. So just a brief illustration of what I mean here. Imagine first we're going to assign meanings to word forms on the basis of sort of how well formed they are, how phonotactically probable they are, and there's no constraint on homophony. So if we have a word like dog, let's assume this is a really well formed word and we have four meanings in our lexicon. 
Um, you know, if we just want to basically assign them to the most probable word form, maybe they all go to dog. But maybe we don't want four meanings assigned to a single word form. Maybe we actually want to redistribute those meanings across space. And so if we have a constraint on homophony, as well as still a pressure to reuse high probability sequences, then naturally some of those meanings might get redistributed to adjacent points in phonotactic space. So maybe we have neighbors of dog, like log or dot, and so some of those meanings that were previously loaded onto dog end up being redistributed across phonotactic space. So this is just kind of a, a brief illustration to, to demonstrate exactly what I mean. Um, and the advantages of this count from a theoretical perspective is that this, this other pressure that I'm talking about against oversaturation is independently motivated. It wasn't originally posited to explain a density in neighborhoods uh, in real lexica. So if it turns out to explain that, that would be kind of like a nice side effect of just already positing this other pressure. Um, and it would explain this dissociation. So it turns out that phonotactics underestimate neighborhood sizes. That's what I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and they also overestimate homophony. And so um, it seems like there might be a natural connection between these two things. So the, maybe instead of two distinct pressures or processes at play, maybe there's a single process that it could, could explain both things. So it seems more parsimonious, in other words, to posit a single pressure. Uh, and under this account, dense neighborhoods would still be beneficial. Those benefits and advantages don't go away of a dense neighborhood, but those are more like positive externalities created by an anti-homophony pressure. Uh, so to test this account, we simulate a series of phonotactic baselines for each target language that we looked at which was matched for the distribution of word lengths in this target language as well as the phonotactics. Um, and then in several of these baselines, we also introduced a limit on homophony. Um, and then uh, we compare across the baselines in the real lexicon, the neighborhood sizes, basically. So the question is, compared to each of these different kinds of baselines, how many uh, neighbors do words tend to have in the real versus the baselines? So the first thing we need to do is learn the phonotactics of these languages. So um, we train a Markov model on the set of unique word forms in a target lexicon. So imagine we have a really simple lexicon with just eight words here. Um, this symbol here just represents this, a start token, basically saying that like this is how words in this language will start. And in this very simple lexicon, they can either start with a D or a B, so there's an equal probability of both those things. We can learn that after a D, uh, the O is the next most likely sound, and I and U are equally likely after that. Um, you can also represent like longer term dependencies, um, depending on how long the chain you have for your Markov model is. And um, we parameterize this N and the N phone model according to each language differently using a cross validation procedure, which I'm happy to talk about later as well. Um, so now once you have this trained model, which basically has learned looking at all the word forms that appear in a language, what are the kinds of sequential dependencies that you observe, you can now generate novel word forms. So you feed it a start token and you say now sample from the set of possible sounds that could occur after that start. Let's say we sample a D. Maybe then we sample from the sounds that could occur after a D. Maybe we sample an O. We sample after that, we get a T. And then eventually we end up sampling an N token, which gives us our completed word form. So this is just a procedure for generating word forms that um, sound like word forms in a real language. Now, um, given this phonotactic model, um, we can generate a lexicon with the same number of words of each length as the target lexicon. So we have our phonotactic model. We generate a candidate word. Um, let's say we need 7,000 one-syllable words, um, 15,000 two-syllable words, and 11,000 three-syllable words, if that's how many are in the real lexicon. We check whether we need more one-syllable words, given that we've just generated one. And if we do, then we add it to this bucket here. Um, and then we just keep adding more as long as we need more um, monosyllabic word forms. Um, let's say we now generate another monosyllabic one. In this case, we just throw it out because we already have too many in that bucket, or we have sufficient a number. Um, the point here is we're really just trying to match the exact distribution of word lengths in the real lexicon. Um, and we continue this process till every bucket is full. And then once we're done, we can um, analyze properties of this lexicon and compare it to um, the real lexicon. Uh, so that was a neutral model where there's no constraint on homophony. We also have an anti-homophone model where if a given word has been added too many times already, we throw it out and resample. So imagine we've already added dot to the lexicon, and let's say we have some constraint in how many times we can add a particular word form to that lexicon. Um, if that's the case, um, then just like we wouldn't be adding more monosyllabic words if that bucket was full, it's kind of a similar case here. If dot has already been added too many times or has too many meanings, we throw it out. Finally, we have what we call an anti-homophone plus model. So this is just a slightly more revamped pressure against homophony. So rather than simply throwing out this uh, word form like dot, um, we convert it to a neighbor if dot is already too homophonous. So this could be kind of interpreted as a, a subtle like pro-neighbor pressure in addition to an anti-homophone pressure. 
Um, so we just convert it to dog. We check whether dog is too homophonous. If it's not, we then add it to the lexicon. Just to kind of explain what I mean when I say too many homophones, what we're looking at here is when we look at the rank distribution of homophones, so what's the most homophonous word in the real lexicon versus, in this case, one of the artificial lexica. This is one of the neutral lexica that we created. Um, and so the most homophonous word form in the real English language, according to our resource, um, had seven additional meanings in, in addition to its original meaning. So um, it's the maximum homophony amount is basically seven meanings, right? And so we want to make sure that the most homophonous word form in our baseline becomes no more homophonous than that. So in other words, we force each nth ranked word to be no more homophonous than the equivalently ranked word form in the real lexicon. And that's a constraint we just keep adding during our generation process. I'm happy to explain that more if that wasn't clear as well. Okay, so now um, in generating each lexicon, we generate 10 artificial lexica for each baseline. And remember, there's three different baseline types, the neutral, anti-homophone, and anti-homophone plus models. We do this for five different languages, um, and then we also identify the optimal n for each language's phonotactic model. And now we can ask how do neighborhood sizes compare across the different baselines that we've generated versus their real counterparts. Um, and so what I'm going to be showing you here is a specific measure of neighborhood size, which is just the average neighborhood size. So um, you look at all the density of different neighborhoods for different words and you just calculate the mean. So um, what I'll be showing you here is on the x-axis, the different languages. On the y-axis, the mean number of minimal pairs. The red dotted line is just the number uh, of the average neighborhood size in that real language. And then each of these violin plots, each of those distributions, correspond to different generation modes. So we have the neutral model, where there's no constraint on homophony, the anti-homophony model, where there is a constraint uh, where we throw out words that could become too homophonous, and then the anti-homophony plus, where we directly convert it to a neighbor. So first of all, as we would expect, we replicate past work showing that in a neutral model with no constraint against homophony, neighborhood sizes tend to be smaller. Now, if I were to show you the homophone counts, these would be larger correspondingly, because there's no constraint in how many meanings could be added. Um, but now we can turn, or yeah, the neutral baselines have smaller neighborhoods than the dotted red lines correspondingly. Um, but if we turn to the anti-homophony baselines, in general, uh, their neighborhoods are at least as large on average. So um, in three of the languages, in fact, the um, anti-homophony baselines end up being having larger neighborhood sizes on average than the real lexicon. So simply by adding this constraint on homophony, we end up generating considerably larger neighborhoods on average. And then finally, if we look at the anti-homophony plus baselines, we uh, find that we actually consistently overestimate neighborhood size. Um, so it suggests that um, certainly that approach uh, ends up being more than sufficient to account for neighborhood sizes. So the question then uh, that we started out with is whether an anti-homophone pressure would be sufficient to account for the average size of phonological neighborhoods. And what we find is that it, it seems to be in, in large part. Um, and that is more parsimonious than positing two distinct pressures. So rather than having you know, a pro-neighborhood pressure and an anti-homophony pressure to, to explain two different things. It seems like one of those pressures might be able to explain at least both things, um, which would be parsimonious from the perspective of the, the theoretical perspective, I guess. Um, and if that's true, that doesn't necessarily erase the, the benefits or advantages that I talked about for dense neighborhoods. They still would facilitate learning and production, but those under this account would be more positive externalities or byproducts of that, of that other process. Um, now, um, of course, there's always uh, limitations. So um, one, one big limitation is just that this is a very limited sample of languages that's relatively biased towards Indo-European languages. Uh, we are trying to look into uh, sort of expanding the set of uh, languages that we look at. The main constraint here is just which languages are sufficiently well documented to have phonological resources that list you know, the phonological transcription of a word as well as how many meanings it has. But that's one direction we're interested in going. Um, another thing that's been, been, another issue that's been raised is that Markov models um, relative to more recent kinds of language models that have been built uh, could result in overfitting. Uh, uh, and so uh, we have actually used uh, an LSTM in more recent work, um, not doing exactly this method, but something kind of qualitatively similar. And we've gotten also somewhat similar results. So that should hopefully kind of uh, assuage some concerns, but it is something that we're, we're looking into more as well. Um, and then finally, from a philosophical perspective, um, although this demonstrates that uh, an anti homophone pressure may be sufficient to account for some kinds of um, larger neighborhood sizes than we were seeing before in the phonotactic models, um, it doesn't demonstrate that, it's, that it is the mechanism responsible. Right? So sufficiency is not necessarily the same thing as necessity, of course. Um, and so I think really what we need to do moving forward is to really start to try to untangle some of the causal mechanisms that actually would underlie these pressures. So rather than just saying at a very high level, there's a pressure for or against homophony or a pressure for or against neighborhoods, 
what are the ways in which sort of at in the level of individual communicative interactions or learning or production um, these pressures might manifest or how would they be implemented? Um, and then also at the level of kind of diachronic language change, how would these pressures play out? Um, okay, looks like I'm, I'm right about time. So um, thank you for listening and then I'm happy to take questions if you have any.